Hi, I'm David Spencer. Welcome to Gardening with Bugs. This video is just going to be a, qu a quick update on what's going on at Full Circle Farm, just to give you an idea of what uh, what can be grown this time of year, um, things to avoid as well, and where we're at with the bug situation. Uh, we've been pretty lucky here on the West Coast this year. Uh, we've had unusually cold weather, but not necessarily freezing temperatures. So other than if there's a freeze in the next couple of weeks, it looks like we started spring pretty early. So that's evident in some of the, some of the plants that are coming up, um, and we'll see how that kind of... Uh, develops as the season goes on because sometimes an early season allows pests to establish earlier but the predators have a different threshold like maybe they have to wait a little bit longer for uh, light levels so it doesn't really matter if uh, the temperature has been warm enough uh, they will only come out at a certain time of year so we'll see I mean that's usually nature has a way of, of balancing itself anyways but um, that's why you might find that season to season there's um your year after year there's different fluctuations in pests or you might remember a specific year where a particular pest was really bad and that tends to be the case like maybe an emergence of some particular pest doesn't match up with a migratory bird pattern and that's what gets things out of whack um again there's not really anything you um you need to do you don't even necessarily need to care about that but sometimes it's just good to know what's going on in your garden so what i want to do is just show you show you what the yard looks like uh, at Full Circle Farm and uh, walk you through some of the beds. So when I designed this garden, um, and I can take you more depth into that uh, in, in a different video, but um, when I designed it, I was kind of imagining looking at a map. And uh, so when I, when I talk about them, I'm thinking that north is up on the map. So um, when I start, I start with beds closest to the house, which are the most northerly ones. And uh, those are the first ones I, I kind of theorized and established. So going across the top here, I've got sort of 20 beds total, um, four columns, if you will, um, and five rows. So across the top are my perennial beds. So the top left here is uh, blueberries. And then going across, I've got raspberries, strawberries. And then the last one, which uh, may be temporarily, is, is rhubarb. I just threw it in there because it was given to me. But it's sort of a, a dry bed, so it works look, or looks really nice this time of year. But it gets quite dry, which is tough for rhubarb without giving it lots of water. But I've also got asparagus in there, which I started from seed. And we're kind of on year four from, from that, so uh, harvesting a few spears as well. Um, what you'll see at this time of year is there's a lot of flowers coming up, spring bulbs in particular. And the reason for that is something like the blueberries flower so early. Uh, what I want to do is kind of encourage pollinators to come. And that, again, that's not all that specific. It does help with pest prevention because, of course, pollinators uh, aren't just bees. In some cases, they're, they're wasps, and wasps are some of the most important predators. Um, but in particular, something like bees, are, they're, so, um, they're so social that they do learn and communicate where flowers are. So um, in theory, in practice, they do tell each other where flowers are. But in theory, I like to think that at least by having um, this particular area established in their minds as a, as a flowering area, then at least they'll come back for something that flowers subsequently. So you'll see in the blueberries I've got, uh, it's about to flower anyways, um, but I've got a lot of daffodils and I did have crocuses there. Raspberries, I haven't established any there yet. Um, and then in the strawberries, I've got hyacinths and there's some tulips and uh, a whole bunch of other ones as well. So the next bed is what I'm calling a successional bed this year. I got, um, I always planted the beds based on the family of plants. So um, everything in the in the carrot family that kind of had deep tap roots, um, except celery is kind of the roots are all over the place. But um, in that family, it has different um, uh, special requirements for soil. That's why sometimes they you talk about crop rotation in terms of planting a um, a rich, heavy feeding plant after something that doesn't feed as much, just to make sure that that soil gets replenished. So when I set mine up, same thing. I thought, how about the all the like carrot family are in a bed one year, then all er, the onion family, um, and then we can go to something like the beet family, and tomatoes, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and 
I still do that for a large part. Um, my tomatoes are usually interplanted with tomatillos and peppers, everything in that nightshade family. And it is a heavy feeder. So as that moves from bed to bed throughout the year, I do follow it with a light crop. And, and usually I try to lead it with a light crop or a nitrogen producing um, cover crop like fava beans, which you'll see in one of the beds. Um, but this year what I decided to do was anything that was uh, like fast food, <laughs> I like to use that term. So like my lettuces, radishes, uh, beets to some extent, um, and then all the all the other greens like spinach and mustards. Um, I like to have a salad basically available to me at all times. Uh, those ones I want to be able to harvest them quick and replant them. So I'm just calling that a successive, a successive bed instead of having those amongst sort of season long plants like onions, which I'm just going to set and forget. Um, this one, at least, that's a, a bed that's going to draw my attention to it more regularly than some of the other ones. So as you can see, I've put in some of these plants. Some of these ones actually overwintered here um, or elsewhere, and I've kind of moved them over. Um, slugs have been bad, but I've got these slug traps out, and it's looking a little bit better. So we talk about early season planting. Um, I always cold condition the plants, um, and that's not just putting them outside for a couple nights in a row, like like or a couple days in a row and bringing them in at night, like is recommended. I, um, as soon as I germinate them, I grow them at the outside temperature, even if it dips below freezing. And what you'll find is things like uh, lettuce, they don't really care if they freeze or not. Um, but you gotta be careful. There's a few that, a few that do, like anything in the brassica family in particular, um, or even things like uh, parsley, things that flower the second year of growth, they're gonna think, even if I started them in like January and put them outside and they freeze, they're going to think that they've survived the winter and it's their next year. So instead of getting nice leafy fo foliage that I want, um, or nice like tight harvestable head like I would in a cabbage, instead they'll just bolt right off the bat. So I don't actually recommend this, it's just something I do really just because I don't have the space to do it inside all the time. Sometimes I can use my commercial greenhouses, but um, that raises uh, problems with, with contamination usually. So um, anyways, I threw these guys out here. They've done okay besides the feeding, but it's really not gonna be until that soil temperature gets high enough and we get enough sun that they're gonna, they're gonna shoot off and the bed's gonna look really good. Okay, next is an example of exactly that cover crop that I mentioned. Uh, it's going to be tomatoes. Uh, so I've got fava beans here and fava beans are great because they grow all winter. Um, I, did, I did do one kind of further off in the yard here that uh, died in, in super cold temperatures, but they're supposed to be cold tolerant and I, I'll have to look in to see why that happened when they're both at the exact same the exact same stage but you can see here like the growth is very slow so I will probably every year I kind of plant them a bit more dense and still I could probably do it denser than that um, but the trick with these guys is they are nitrogen fixing like the bean family is but only because they have nodes in their roots that um, that have a bacteria on them actually that that take nitrogen and and turn it into something that's that's processable and the reason that the plant does that is because it needs a huge amount of nitrogen in order to produce its, its fruit, which is the beans. So once those beans are produced, that nitrogen's out of the soil. So you can till these plants in if you're, fi if you're trying to fix nitrogen, either before the fruit have set or with the fruit, the beans. Um, otherwise, if you're gonna let it um, produce them and you're gonna collect them, you've basically not robbed the, the bed of that nitrogen, but it's no different than any other uh, any other cover crop. Luckily, it's a nice lush plant, so it does break down quite quickly, even if you do drop it in. The best thing for me in this case is that it also flowers quite early. So again, I get a flowering, pretty substantial crop um, quite early in the year. I do have a cannabis plant in here, and that was just to show some friends that are, are interested in growing cannabis and still believe like the, gar the garage or basement style of, of growing cannabis is is the only way to do it, which is like in a hot garage with fans blowing all over the place. I threw this guy out at the beginning of March, which in theory should have forced it to flower. Um, it did freeze as well, and it's uh, pretty ugly looking, but has survived, so we'll see how that one does. I do have a couple beds on this side that I uh, just haven't processed, and actually I would have had a cover crop, but I'm going to be topping up the soil on these ones. So um, one of them is, is just uh, vacant. The next one, I've actually thrown amaranth seeds down there. So that's going to be my beet family one. Um, but instead of doing, um, instead of having beets in there and chard, um, I put the chard with some of the plants that are um, like long season greens harvesting plants, like um, like celery and um, parsley. 
they're in that bed and then the beats are in the successive bed so that leaves kind of the amaranth on its own from that family it's beautiful we're gonna use it as cut flowers as well as whatever's left we'll either feed the birds or else we'll collect it it's quite an easy grain to grain to collect Okay, the garlic bed, nice and simple. Um, this one actually had rows of garlic before, which I, I dug out and normally I'm moving the plants around, but I've, I kind of reset uh, my order this year. So this one had a few and you can kind of see where, um, instead of being nicely spaced, you can see a whole bunch really close together. And that's because I left one that obviously each little clove now is, is um, sending up a shoot. Um, and there is a kind of an area where it didn't come up as well. Other than that, it's fine. And garlic's a funny one for me because every fall, everybody's like, when do I plant garlic? When do I plant garlic? And there's all this debate about too early and too late. Um, and to me, the, the fact that I left one in and it sprouted is, is just proof that it doesn't really matter. Like they're not gonna rot or anything like that. You do increase the chance of, of um, you know, maybe a pest establishing that, that will feed on them. That's why the rotate rotation of those types of plants is important um, and you can get molds and funguses if it's if it's wet too uh, too early and if it's hot too early like if you plant them too early in the summer of course you could kind of trick it into thinking it's the it's the year previous or something like that but uh, but really this is it's just a no-brainer same with the mulching this time of year people are putting it on or taking it off and there's all that discussion to me, you can throw it on in the winter, but they're frost tolerant, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, we had like minus 15 here or something close to that. Um, they didn't die. I didn't have a mulch on it. Um, and then if I did, I would take it off early now anyways, because I want that soil to heat up. So there's no way I'm gonna mulch it until I'm trying to conserve water later on. And then right through the middle, this is an interesting one. This is part of the original plan as well. I, I understand the, uh, the importance of a water feature and flowers for the health of the garden and so without even getting into the idea of, of growing cut flowers I had these two beds that instead of being 5 by 15 like all of my beds are they're 5 by 10 which left a little bit of room in the middle to do a little feature pond um, this was just a temporary one that I've got here um, and that really was to promote the insects like in the summertime it's easy with a little bit of water feature to see how important that is because you'll see dragonflies and all sorts of uh, insects and wasps and bees coming in for a drink um, and then mosquito you're generating mosquitoes which is not a bad thing mosquitoes are pollinators as well um, and they, f they feed a whole bunch of other uh, insects so really that to me is kind of like the battery of the yard especially in the summertime and then the flower gar the flower gardens were of course to try to attract insects into the yard um, now they're both perennial flower beds so I've got like dahlias and and other sort of tubers or, or bulbs going on there and that's just going to be something that we can uh, we can kind of set and forget and then we've got the next bed which will be uh, one of the rotational beds which is going to be all of our annual flowers Okay, this is another uh, successional garden. So same thing, I've got uh, lettuces, spinach, arugula, um, a couple beets and, and radishes in here as well. Um, again, a little bit early, but we'll see. Um, all of these guys were planted inside, so I did them in, um, in plugs and then into small like solo cups I've used just because I had, um, they were cheap. Or else I've got these little four inch pots as well. Um, and then they've moved out to the garden uh, just within the last week or two. And from now on, I'll probably be direct sowing into the garden. Okay, my onions, uh, similar to the garlic, except I start these, instead of going over the, over the winter, I start these in the um, in late winter. Uh, these guys, again, were just seeded directly into plugs. Um, and then they were set out a little bit earlier than I normally do. So these guys were set out here um, a few weeks ago, kind of in early March. Again, they're frost tolerant, so it doesn't matter. They're not gonna freeze and die. They're just gonna think it's winter time, no big deal. Um, the only problem is they are a bit susceptible and I'm seeing a couple of them have been either stepped on by a larger animal or, or eaten, um, but I've got tons, so it's okay. Okay, so this next one's a bit unfortunate in that I'm doing brassicas in it this year, which, which wasn't really the plan, but because I've changed the rotation, it will be. Um, and rotation is so important. So I'm going to run into probably some um, brassica pests. Um, probably the worst is the, is the butterfly. Um, the cabbage moth 
um, just because the caterpillars do so much damage, especially for some of the ones that you you visually don't want the damage on. Like um, like I'm I'm tolerant of, of leafy greens with some bites in it, but things that I'm less tolerant with are, are holes in cabbage and uh, and half eaten Brussels sprouts. So I might struggle a bit with those ones, but I've actually I've actually got an opportunity to bring in a bunch of soil, so I'm going to till this one quite heavily anyways before I put it in. And tilling does kill the good and the bad bugs in the soil. Uh, and it exposes other ones to birds. Uh, so it's it's sort of it's a good technique when you do have a problem. Even if you have a weed problem, like tilling is good. Um, there's I actually set this up as a no-till garden, and that even the no-till principle kind of requires you to dig it, at least in like the Jevons model that I use to uh, dig, loosen the soil the first year as well as in the subsequent year, just to make sure that it stays kind of nice and, and leafy, and you've you've gotten rid of some of those uh, pests and or weeds. But in the meantime, I've also got stinging nettle here, which I think I've covered in, in uh, another video. Um, it spreads with, with runners underground. So when I do till this one, I've got to be pretty careful to get all that out. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move that one. That's kind of the only way I can keep it controlled is, is by moving it and digging it up and moving it. Um, and then last year's like tall kale, which actually moved into this bed. I'm just going to let them flower as well as last year's uh, rutabagas. You can tell my kids don't like turnips and rutabagas. Um, I'm just going to let them flower. I'm not in a rush to get the broccoli. And in fact, they, they were only seeded about two weeks ago now. Um, and they got a long ways to go still. I'm not, not really in a big rush there. And I'll probably do uh, maybe two different seedings this, uh, like early ones and then later ones to get through the summer. And actually, I'll, I'll of course, do a third one from the fall to, to overwinter some of the brassicas. Uh, so no rush. And what I'll do is I'll let those flower. That's just food for the bugs. In the meantime, you can eat them. Uh, they are delicious and um, then I'll cut them down afterwards. Okay, so here's one of these um, long season. I, I always wanna say perennial just because it's sort of something I can kind of forget about, but, uh, but it's not. They're annuals that I can just sort of forget about for the most part. Um, and that is these, uh, the celery and the, the parsley. And this will also have parsnips, but I don't throw those seeds until a little bit later. Um, and I do have some cilantro in there right now, but, and which will go into successive gardens, but I just popped it in because there was the space. Um, so these guys, it's celery I just cut and come again, like I don't cut the the whole head and, and sell that. I, I could if I've got some extra ones, but um, the plant just seems to do fine just by picking them. So if I need to make uh, spaghetti sauce, I need a couple, I can just go around and pick kind of the biggest ones. Uh, if, we, if we haven't been using them a lot, I can just cut a whole bunch of the, like one per plant of the stalks and go sell them up at the stand and um, organic celery is, is hard to come by so it's pretty nice and uh, a lot of people have struggled with it that tough um, they say it's tougher like stronger in flavor and stuff like that and I haven't noticed that or maybe I'm a bit tolerant and I'm not too sure so I've actually been asked to uh, to do a video on celery and maybe we will I'll just see how these guys start off but again these guys were seeded on oh, boy like week five maybe indoors started at 20 uh, Celsius um, and then they immediately went out, like I talked about that cold conditioning, as long as they don't freeze and then immediately bolt because they think that they've overwintered, um, they're, they're quite frost tolerant. Like I'll leave these guys in the ground until, you know, November, basically until the, the first uh, hard freeze when it all turns to mush. But before that, I'm harvesting fresh celery like right through into November. All right, this bed is, um, it's going to be a tomato bed. Uh, it's got potatoes in it now that just haven't come up yet. Um, and then it's going to be cherry tomatoes. And so with whatever room I've got in here, it'll probably, we'll probably end up with um, uh, some tomatillos or, or um, I was going to say peppers, but that, that bed is, is quite shaded. So they probably won't end up there. Um, but I do have a lot of alyssum planted in there and some marigolds, which, um, which I didn't mention. I've also gotten all the successive beds is at least a row of alyssum somewhere. Um, you don't have to use alyssum. What I, I like about it is it's very high in nectar, so it's, it, it's a huge attractant for um, for pollinators, but especially for wasps. Now remember, I say wasps a lot, and I don't just mean yellow jackets and uh, the ones that sting us. I, I do mean all the like, like almost microscopic ones that are parasitoids. In fact, of all the wasp species, in which, in which there's like hundreds around here at least, um, only a few of them sting and the rest of them are parasitoids so, so they, they're stingers actually laying eggs inside of a pest um, and the one some of them I really rely on like the natural aphidious species 
of wasp, which parasitizes aphids, will show up um, kind of in waves. They're, they're probably different species themselves. Um, and parasitize different species of aphids. So one of them comes in March and another one kind of shows up well throughout, well, throughout the summer actually. Um, and there's another tiny one that does uh, sort of like the hop aphid or something like that, which is um, quite a small species. And those guys, um, they some, some wasp spe species feed on whatever it is they parasitize as well. Um, but that's not always the case. Some of them have to have flowers as well. And I've found that with alyssum and buckwheat, which is another kind of cover crop I'll use, um, they, seem to disproportionately attract uh, wasps which you know I'm not trying to exclude the other guys but that just seems like a very helpful way to get <laughs> to get some beneficial insects in the garden so I do have that right there and that will also help shade the root so it's kind of a green mulch for the tomatoes and of course the mulching of tomatoes is so important because you got to keep those roots wet or else they can't uptake the calcium that they need and you end up with blossom end rot um, which um, most people just they know that it's calcium so sometimes they just keep pumping calcium into the into their garden but um because calcium is a mineral it's not going anywhere so if that's not the problem if, if the problem is that they just can't uptake it because it's um they're going through fluctuations in both root temperature and and humidity you're wasting all that calcium but also it's going to be in there and maybe a detriment to some other plants so so be careful with that and make sure that you mulch your your tomatoes Okay, this one was a brassica and it's going to be another successive one. I actually threw some uh, poppy seeds in here, um, but this is some cheap soil that I got from uh, from my commercial greenhouse. It's just some stuff we were dumping and it, it's winter formula to allow good drainage. It has a ton of perlite and that's what you see here, this white stuff, uh, which is just like a volcanic rock that's sort of uh, puffed up. Um, so it's great for aeration and, um, and drainage. Uh, but we had some really heavy rains and that top, like the top centimeter gets saturated this stuff floats to the top and it's probably very bad for germinating seeds so if nothing comes up I, I think I'll blame it on that um, and it really looks untidy it looks like it's snowed especially if you're further back okay so this is the next uh, brassica bed so I have two because brassicas take up so much room so one of them will have things like um, Brussels sprouts and cabbages and broccoli which you know if you're thinking about the square foot kind of design they're both kind of like one plant per square foot quite big um, and then so this bed I've started off with the kale which I've actually seeded far too close together uh, but that's fine for me because I can just remove them as I want in the meantime I kind of like that uh, that canopy that they create especially for the summertime because that again will shade their roots um, plus I'm harvesting them all the time so I'm going to be naturally thinning it uh, but also they they tend to get tall especially later in the year so the closer they are to some extent when they're not really competing um, it's easier to kind of prevent them from falling over that's definitely true of, of Brussels sprouts that end up uh, toppling over in, in the winter if they're just under their own weight Okay, and that's it. I've, obviously, there's a couple beds I skipped over because they're not quite ready. And here's the greenhouse. So I've just got a ton of things going on here. I've got some sunflowers that have started up, some extra like um, celery and parsley, which um, which I didn't end up putting in the garden because maybe we didn't need them. Uh, all sorts of successive um, uh, crops that I just uh, haven't put out yet. Like I said, the rest of them will probably be direct sowing. So these are kind of the last ones that I've seeded. Um, and so actually some strawberries and whatever there's some uh, there's some interesting plants in, in the mix here uh, and this cold is just a cold frame so it's at 20 degrees celsius on a, on a day like this which is probably 12 and uh, overcast pretty nice day though actually um, it's already getting too hot like when the sun hits it it's it's venting just with an automatic uh, lever on the on the top vent um, and it's tough. I've, I haven't never really been managed to use this that effectively. It does prevent quite a bit of freezing and I might uh, button it up a bit more just to make it more secure in the winter because in the summer I really can't use it at all. Anything in there will cook. It's it's well over 40 degrees but it's a nice thing to have just to, to get all these started plants out. I did have a, a rat in here eating especially my peas and so if you notice the rat traps that's what those are for. I've also got this great uh, this great patio, which is again south facing. My whole yard is is south facing, with a bit of a aspect towards the the south too, so it can get quite hot. And we've got this concrete patio that was put in before we moved in, um, which is great. Which is great. I love it. And the kids love it. And it's fun to play around. But I immediately recognize like the heat and the fact that I'm I'm not going to put a watering system in there just because I don't want to uh, dig up the concrete in order to put it down there. So this one to save water and just take advantage of that is our sort of Mediterranean garden. So you'll see a lot of the Mediterranean 
styled herbs. I mean, I got lavender and stuff like that, but I've got sage and thyme and rosemary um, and oregano up here as well. Uh, and then the rest of it's just sort of like, just for looks, like the big rosemary and, and lavender, and it, as well as the uh, olives. And I've got the Meyer lemon, which is, did not do too well in the minus 15 this year, which, which is unfortunate, because otherwise it's done, it's done pretty well. As for the bugs, I've got uh, not a lot to, to share right now. Leaf hoppers are everywhere. Um, they've never really been a commercial pest that people are too concerned about. And until recently, a lot of people are kind of wondering why their numbers are popping up. And for that, uh, we have we have no idea. The um, Again, I don't really see them as, as a major plant pest. And so I always think that might be people's tolerance. They just, if they see a bug, they know what it is. They know it's uh, feeding on the plant. They want to get rid of it. But um, in all fairness, that that's just not one that you really need to be worried about. There are there are some and in some areas where they they can vector plant diseases, uh, but you're outside, and so like to me, just having a variety of plants, whatever the natural predator of, of a leaf hopper is, they'll show up, and it's going to be parasitoids and and some generalist predators anyway. So. You don't need to worry too much about those guys. I do have in a couple of the beds something digging in there. And it could be raccoons, rabbit, rat, it could be a crow. It doesn't really matter what it is, it matters what it's after. And if you notice these holes here, um, it's right along the, the boards that I've used. So it's going probably for something like uh, slugs, because I've tilled the garden, so the only place the, the slug probably um, has still existed if they're in there is right up snug against the, the wood, which they actually like anyways, especially for laying eggs. Um, or something that's composting the wood, like a pill bug, a roly-poly, if you will. Um, and then grubs as well. So again, when I till it, it's hard to get right next, uh, right hard against the wood, so it could be something like that. So. That's something I need to be a, a bit aware of, of, of what's going in there, but it might also just be advantageous for whatever the animal is to kind of poke around. So um, I'm not gonna worry too much about that one, um, but I will keep monitoring that, those particular beds to see if there's a pest in the soil that I need to get rid of. And if you're worried about that, the condition of the wood, um, I used just like really cheap wood, like spruce, because I, I had to build so much and it got very expensive uh, in the planning process. So instead of doing something like cedar, I did want to use wood. I didn't want to use something uh, too permanent. Um, and I especially didn't want to use something that has any sort of a chemical um, potential in it, like treated wood. Um, and so I, I opted out for the cheaper wood and, and maybe this will come back to bite me in the butt. Like I've already have to kind of re-secure it every, every once in a while with new nails. But um, the reason why I'm okay with it is that I don't mind the woods breaking down. Like all the stuff that I've buried, like these are actually all two feet deep. And so in some cases, if you only see them a foot above, it means they've gone down a foot below. And down there, the wood is especially rotten. Um, but it's fine for me. Like that was originally a barrier for for the weeds. It was also um, forced me to dig and loosen the soil down to two feet, which is important for plant roots. Like even though you pull one up and it looks like the roots are only a few inches deep, most of the of the kind of the veggie and flower garden plants that we use do best around that two foot depth. Some of them like beets actually go down nine feet. Like when you pull it, most of that root matter stays down there, but they can send their, their roots that deep. Now you don't have to loosen that far because the ones that do send their roots that deep, it's usually because they have the ability to break up clay and other sort of tougher materials that are down below. But regardless, this, this wood, it, when it breaks down, it's providing habitat for a bunch of bugs that aren't, they're just compost bugs. Um, they're not usually a risk to, to my plants. There are a couple exceptions, and I call these the COVID pests, like the roly-poly is a good one. People have started composting more and putting kind of raw compost, like not broken down enough compost into their garden, which, which is providing a whole bunch of food for all these composting bugs. Um, some of which will attack your, yeah, especially young, susceptible plants, not really because they're plant pests, but because they're, they're looking for water. It just happens to be there coincidentally. So you got to be a bit careful when you put on too much compost. Like definitely put in a bit and mix it with natural soil. That's the absolute best, most natural sort of thing you can do. Um, but that's exactly what I'm getting here with the breakdown of, of some of this wood. And so it will break down quite quickly. I'm aware of that. I might need to redo them, but at least now if I do go for something more expensive like cedar, at least instead of doing 20 of these 15 by five by two foot beds, I could probably just knock off one or two at a time.
So that's my little quick walkthrough of the garden for um, March 31st of 2022. Uh, if you're curious about exactly what I've seeded or my seeding schedule, I'll, I'll post that on um, on my website. And there's a link to the website from my uh, from this video. You know, it's always good. There's tons of resources for that. Like, I'm by all means, not the be all end all expert in that sort of stuff. But it's always worth having uh, having a couple of people's inputs on the on something like that, especially if it's somebody that lives closer to you. So if you want more content like this, please follow and I'll see you in the next one.